What's up, everybody? Another week. NFL Food for Thought Week 3 podcast coming at ya. I'm the loose Justin Carlucci, and I got the Chief Will Priester alongside of me. What's going on, buddy? Good to see you again. Nothing much, man. Doing good. Uh, glad to come on. It's another week. We're heading into week three already. And uh, so, so excited to uh, to come on and, and, and hang out and talk with you guys, talk shop, talk football, talk props, uh, sports betting in general, the league in general. Should be another fantastic podcast in the books. We got audio. We got video. Of course, I can't forget about the commission. So awesome that you're joining us to talk about what happened over the weekend and a look ahead to week three. How are you, man? Good to see you. I'm doing good, man. The The NFL season has been pretty good to me so far. It's been exciting just to have football back on television. And of course, love any excuse to, to come on here and talk with you guys. So very happy that football's back. I'm in a good mood. Yeah, it's been a crazy season. I know nothing, apparently. Uh, but we've had some success at scores and odds. So if you want to see what Chiefs on, you want to see what the commission's on, you want to see what I'm betting on, check out Scores and Odds. Our expert picks are awesome. We also have a bunch of great free premium content as well, where a bunch of our guys give out free picks. And, of course, Parlay IQ, our new state-of-the-art betting tool, which is phenomenal. And you have access to it for free right now. Correlations, same-game parlays, easier way to analyze these games and make some money. Definitely check that stuff out. Parlay IQ is awesome. Totally awesome. Um, that being said, we had just an amazing week two of NFL football. A lot of surprises. I will throw it over to Chief first, and I think I know what you're going to start with in our little elephant of the room segment. We low-key were talking about a game that could be a shootout, and it sure as hell delivered. So don't you hate it when you you get it all the way right and somebody else wins all the money? I mean, don't you just hate that? I mean, you come on, you provide all this great content for people, and their lineups are still better than yours. And, and quite frankly, there were a lot of lineups better than mine this week. After I already knew the mega chalk, not chalk stack, but the sneaky let me take down a milli stack was the Miami Ravens game. I mean, we talked about Dolphins Ravens on Tuesday. I mean, and we specifically said this is the, the sneaky shootout game. And and granted, a part of it was uh, that the Dolphins were just so far behind early. And that really pushed the envelope for Tua to push the ball down the field. Uh, I can't say enough about how Tua was able to just dig this team up out of an early grave and and – Will this team to a win, if you will? Now, he had tons of help from Tyreek Hill late, had tons of help from Jalen Waddle early. And I think this is what the Miami Dolphins envision. And I think it's something we talked about uh, either last week or earlier when we had we had a pod earlier. They went out and got to a, another weapon. And so when teams go out and get weapons, the idea is that they're investing in the quarterback. Same thing for Jalen Hurts. And we saw Jalen Hurts week one have a, have a tremendous connection with A.J. Brown. When, when teams go out and they say, hey, we're going to get you a weapon, we're going to get you the ultimate weapon that's available, and the Eagles go and do that, and you know the Miami Dolphins go and do that, and dare I say the Cleveland Browns go and do that, even though they're going to have to wait for their weapon to show up, He's on the way later this season. When teams go out and do that, they're saying, we believe in this team. We want you to be successful. And the Tyreek Hill show and the connection with Tua and Jalen Waddle paid off tremendous dividends yesterday. Partially, number one, they've got speed everywhere, speed on both sides of the ball. And secondly, when you're going to play against, you know, an, an idiotic coach and Jim Harbaugh who just, is anemic to kicking field goals at all, uh, you're going to win football games. And so while, you know, I'm celebrating the Miami Dolphins, I think the big elephant in the room is I think Jim, I think Harbaugh needs to be out of, out of uh, Baltimore. And listen, you know me, man, I'm always controversial. I don't mind saying what feels like the unpopular opinion, but I'm telling you right now, if Harbaugh, if Harbaugh, 
is out of Baltimore, they win more football games. This I can almost assure you if they have any type of coaching competency. I'm not saying going to get, you know, some college coach that's unproven. I'm saying you go and get a competent NFL coach, the Baltimore Ravens will win more football games than with Harbaugh. That's nothing against Harbaugh. He's been there. He's paid his dues. But you can't pay Justin Tucker to just kick extra points. You can't do that. The best kicker in the NFL, and he gets to kick extra points most of the game. Every fourth and one, they go for it. They're up 21 points. They go for it on fourth and one and don't get it. Kick the field goal, right? And I know the analytics say, let's keep pushing it. But if they want to kick those two field goals, there's no way the Dolphins come back and win this game. No way. All right. I'm done. Okay. I said I was done. I got one more statement. And Nick, I promise I'm going to shut up and let you do your thing. You talk about teams investing for winning, investing for the future. And I get to look at my stupid Carolina Panthers go and pick up Baker Mayfield. And I said this from the beginning. I was going to be on board with Baker as a quarterback until he proved me wrong. And trust me, we got a lot more things wrong than Baker Mayfield. And it starts with Matt Rule. But I won't go there right now. Gosh, just could we go out and get a stud to push the franchise forward in Carolina? Nick, that's food for thought in a nutshell. Uh, back, back over to you, Nick. I'm just uh, – I got so much more to talk about, but I got to let you get in on the juice. Man, I remember talking in the preseason with you about the Carolina Panthers, and you were in such a bad mood because of Baker, because of the coaching staff. And now here we are about two months later, and you're still in the same bad mood. It's it, it's tough to see. Uh, definitely rooting for you. Hopefully next time I get on the show, you're in a better mood. That's not my <laughs> elephant in the room. I, I think my elephant in the room, it, it's got to be the Los Angeles Chargers. I hopped on a podcast last week, and I talked about there, there was no chance the Chargers were going to win that game against Patty Mahomes and, and Andy Reid. And even though it started off relatively good for the Chargers, you, they were down 10 before that meaningless score in the fourth quarter. And, and, and a lot of it comes down to coaching. A lot of it comes down to just being undisciplined in my mind. And we saw week one, they jumped out to a big lead against the Raiders. They scored on their first possession out of the second half. And then their final five drives of the game, they had 45 yards of total offense. Didn't make a whole lot of headlines because they still managed to escape with a win. Went a lot different in week two when they were up 10-7. Again, scored on that first drive out of the half. Went up 17-7. to And then we didn't hear from from them again until they're down 20-17. to And then Herbert throws a pick on the goal line because they won't get Everett out of the game. And, and I have to clear the air on this. Anyone that wants to blame Everett for running a quote-unquote lazy route on that ball that got picked or not giving max effort, the man had caught back-to-back passes before that was begging to get out of the game they were on the kc 36 they went to ever for 20 for uh 29 yards to get down to the seven they went to Everett again to get down to the three yard line the guy's a human being he was gassed he's when a you, big man too he's a big man even a little man you're gonna struggle to breathe if you're running 30 yards you're going tempo that was the other thing they went tempo it wasn't just that this dude's begging to get off the field he just ran 30 yards got hit a couple of times then he's sprinting over to the sidelines because he's assuming if he's begging to get out of the game that they're going to get him out of the game. So then he's got to sprint back to the line of scrimmage, and then they go tempo, and then they throw him the football. That's it's just, Brandon Staley, right? It's bad like, coaching. It's bad everyone... coaching. And that's on Herbert, too. That's on Herbert, too. You have a guy with as much talent as Herbert has. He's excellent going through his progressions. If that call was on Staley, if Staley said we're going back to Everett, that's his fault. It's also Herbert's fault, unless Herbert doesn't have any discretion at the line of scrimmage, which would be a huge, huge coaching gaffe by by Staley to not give his talented quarterback more discretion at the line to read what he sees and to understand what's going on in the game. If Herbert has discretion, then that's on him. Why are you going back to a guy that can't breathe? That does not make any sense. You're on the three-yard line. That Very, very disappointing if you're a Chargers fan, but it was not shocking to me in the slightest. I also have to apologize to Tua. Not fully, because I'm still not totally bought into this. I, dr- I, I drug him through the mud in the preseason. And I think for good reason. Two has been a colossal disappointment throughout his NFL career. But as you mentioned, Chief, adding, adding Tyree Kill, and now you have the speed with him and Waddle, you get behind the defense. Anyone could chuck the ball up in the air 40, 50 yards. This is why I'm saying I'm not, I'm not, I'm not giving Tua all the credit for this. 
but still six touchdowns, almost 500 yards passing. That was a big win for them. I think McDaniels is a genius, and I think we're going to continue to see that throughout the season. But I wanted to offer a partial apology to my guy, Tua, and I hope there's no hard feelings. I will offer a full apology if you can sustain the success going forward. Well, I'll I'll circle back to that game before we switch gears. But um, touching on the Chargers thing, I mean, we saw Brandon Staley. Everyone was drinking the Kool Aid in the first half of last season. No, oh, Coach of the Year candidate. Like that's all. That's all. That's all it was, right? And then we saw him just make atrocious, aggressive calls uh, down the stretch that just killed the Chargers, right? Like the egregious one on his own, like thirty-five, and in one of the biggest games of the Chargers of the last decade. Um, I don't know if you saw the ESPN numbers that they put out, but in that game, he cost his team almost 10 percentage points uh, to, of the outcome to come out with a win. So, like, just from top to bottom, you, you pretty much nailed it. There's no discipline there. And I've said it on these podcasts. There's something I can't put my finger on about the Chargers, even dating back to Drew Brees era where they had all this talent, that I just I can't buy into them, right? You have this roster – and the defense is loaded. I mean, Nick, you, you've analyzed every single team from top to bottom. That defense that the Chargers have, at least on paper, is sick. Like, like From a talent perspective. Talent. But, but right. still, it doesn't, matter what, it doesn't matter what the talent is. If you don't have the right guy pulling the strings, You're you right. can put immense talent in a lot of inopportune situations week after week. And I think we, can, we continue to see that with the Chargers and with other teams around the NFL. And we talk about that. Chief and I talk about that a lot with quarterbacks and just, you know, getting thrown into the NFL into the wrong system, which, you know, you could have a terrible three years, but maybe you have three different OCs and then you get into a better situation. Like, like Mitch Trubisky kind of looks better than he did in the beginning of his career. Cause he was, you know, thrown off a cliff of Matt Nagy um, and company, but circling back to this Miami Baltimore game, I'll throw it over to you commission. And then I'll let chief offer something and then I'll pick up an outfit in the room after that. But it, it both, Defense, like playing devil's advocate here, both secondaries are bad. Baltimore, again, for the second year in a row, is decimated in the secondary. Uh, Miami's secondary really isn't anything to write home about. Kamish, you're kind of the, the quarterback whisperer, so you gave you gave Tua some kudos here. It's, and maybe, 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 I mean, you were unbiased enough to come on here and apologize to the guy, so I will ask you, does – are you a little worried about both defenses a little bit? I mean, the Baltimore front seven, you know, the Ravens typically carry a stigma that they're tough and, you know, they are pretty talented. But a little bit of this has to be about the poor play of the defenses, I think, with all the success that Lamar, who is going to get the bag of all bags next season from somebody, by the way, and Tua had all this success. I, you know, how much is the poorest play of these defenses coming in here with, with the uh, success that both teams had offensively on Sunday? I think a good chunk of it. Kyle Hamilton looked about as bad as any football player can look, I think, for the Ravens. I, I wasn't very high on Miami's defense coming into the year. I know they have a lot of a lot of hype. They have a lot of seemingly talented pieces on that defense, but I wrote about it in the, the scores and odds team preview that I did that this defense has holes at every level. They have a ton of talent at every level, but when you have one really bad player at all three levels of the defense, it doesn't matter if it doesn't like in football, it doesn't matter if nine guys on a play execute their assignment perfectly. If one or two guys leaves a guy open, then, then I think this is where this happens of guys get open downfield. Uh, you, you have broken coverages. You have coverages that just aren't as tight as they need to be. Uh, somebody misses a tackle in, in one of the gaps that, uh, on, on a design run, things like that. Baltimore, I'm a little bit less pessimistic. I think they just got into a weird game script and, they, they looked pretty good, I thought, in the first half. And they just got into this weird game script where you go up 21 points and you start to take your foot off the gas pedal a little bit. And then, oh, it's like I took my foot off the gas pedal just a little bit too much. And then all of a sudden you're not running it at full speed with guys like Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle on the field. I think Baltimore will bounce back. I think they're, they're minus three against New England this upcoming week. I think it's the most gross line on the entire slate. But they still do have some holes, right? Like I think some of the guys that we expected to come in right away and make a tremendous impact are just not at this point. But I do think, I think the game script played a lot more into Baltimore's defensive struggles this week than it did Miami. Miami, I think will continue to struggle. New England might have the worst offense in the entire NFL. So I read, I would read nothing into the fact that they only gave up seven points in week one. I think the fact that they gave up 28 in the first half to the Baltimore Ravens who were more or less held in check by the New York Jets the week before that, I think that's 
more concerning to me. And I would like going to play. I think they play Buffalo in week three, going to play Josh Allen. That that is going to be a pretty significant test for this defense. And if they're not going to figure it out sooner than we might be talking about them later as man, like Tua needs some help, right? We've been talking about Tua is the problem. Tua might need some help later in the season if we continue to see this happen week in and week out. Chief, anything else about this game? I mean, Lamar looks just fine without Hollywood Brown. Richard Bateman has came in and, and has proven that he can be a second-year playmaker here for Baltimore. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, I think Lamar is going to be fine. I, I don't think they're going to win a Super Bowl, though, for, for what it's worth. Like, I, I don't think Baltimore is winning a Super Bowl anytime soon. And part of it is, you know, they got to deal with the Bills. They got to deal with the Chiefs. The a- AFC is tough. To get to the Super Bowl, that, that's that's the bottom line. I mean, yeah. those, those are just the facts. Uh, l- let me say this. Do, do you mind if I pull one more slight elephant uh, or, or elephant in the room from last week, if that's okay? Go for it. And then we'll. Uh, Nick has one that I can piggyback off of, so go for it, Chief. This is, this is a, a two-in-one, if you will. I do want to get your thoughts on this. Maybe, maybe even a three-in-one. First of all, how in the world did the Raiders lose that game to the Cardinals? That, that That's number one. Two, are the Bengals actually awful? And three, where's the scoring in Denver? And I know that's kind of a three for there. But, you know, after week one, we thought the Cardinals, oh, this team's bad. Well, they just happened to play probably – the best team in football or or one of the top three teams in football. Okay. They get a pass and then they come and dig themselves out of a grave against the Raiders Two, the Bengals lose to the Steelers in just such tough fashion on field goals. And then they beat a Dak Cowboy list or a a Dak list Cowboys. They lose to the Dak list Cowboys by a field goal. No, No, barely any touchdowns being scored by this team. And then the same thing in Denver, except this week they got to face Houston, who they should have beat anyway. I, this is very strange after a couple weeks for these teams because it's one thing if they're putting up a lot of points and then they're losing, but they're not putting up a lot of points and they're losing. I, I'm very afraid for these three teams after two weeks, probably an overreaction. But I'm, I'm going to be tracking this handful because, you know, the Raiders, once again, what, what did we talk about at the top of the show, or at least my elephant in the room? When you go out and get someone a weapon, you're expecting them to improve. And Devontae Adams is there, and they, they're not improving, uh, at, at least on the surface. Let's go with that. Uh, so I, I just want to get you guys' brief thoughts. Uh, I, I don't think this is something to, to overlook completely. Um, but, yeah, w- what are you guys' thoughts on those three teams specifically? Cincinnati, the Broncos, who I actually picked to win the division sneakily, and uh, – and and, uh, and the Raiders, I'm I'm, I'm kind of shocked with these dreadful performances. Even though even though some of them won yesterday, it's bad. All right, guys, what do you think? Personally, I haven't been high on the Raiders. I'm probably the least high on the Raiders out of anybody, dating back to last season. I just don't think they're a good football team. Uh, I'm not a Derek Carr believer. You have a new head coach there. You know, you've had a lot of turnover, right, with the whole staff. So there's been a lot of changes there. Kudos to the Cardinals for the way they played Devontae Adams, though. I mean, Devontae Adams coming off a monster 17-target week one game was the chalk play of DFS. Uh, yeah, he scored a touchdown, but that's about it. He, he really wasn't relevant at all. So uh, I, I don't know. I can't really buy into the Cardinals either. I think they have an average defense. They're dinged up as well, uh, you know, DeAndre Hopkins is out a few more weeks. Marquise Brown hasn't really developed any continuity yet with Kyler. Um, A lot of moving parts on both sides. I I do think Arizona was fortunate to come away with that win. If it wasn't for his God-gifted physical talent, they would have lost that game because those fourth and goals and the two-point conversions, Kyler Murray literally willed that team to a win. That that was incredible. Uh, After all the heat that guy's taken from – critics and social media and people saying he doesn't study. You know, it wasn't an efficient game for him. I don't really think the Raiders' defense is that good. I don't think either of these teams are fantastic. I think they're competitive. I think they're about 500 ball clubs. So uh, I'm not really shocked that this game had a super volatile kind of second half and someone collapsed. I wouldn't be surprised either way. So um, 
it, it's hard for me to picture either of these two teams as contenders. I mean, it made for great football last week. It was a really exciting ending, but – they're two teams that are uh, are going to be really difficult to handicap, I think. Um, there's a lot of moving parts and, and still a lot of things yet to be seen. What do you think, Kamish? The Raiders are awful. That's what I think. Thank you. you Thank you. You, you mentioned Devontae Adams, his incredible performance in week one. The stats were great. And he's got Derek Carr to thank for that because Hunter Renfro, if you watch the film back on that game, was open all afternoon. And the dude ended up with, th- I think, three catches for like 21 yards. So Devontae Adams kept getting fed the ball, but Devontae Adams wasn't more open than Hunter Renfro. So, yeah, like good for Devontae Adams coming down with all those balls. But if you wanted to win that football game, maybe hit Hunter Renfro underneath a couple more times. That's my thoughts, which definitely is not a take that's going to go over well because Hunter Renfro fumbled twice yesterday, the second one in overtime that went back for the touchdown. So uh, maybe caveat that a little bit. But the Raiders last year, they were the fourth team in NFL history to make the postseason with a point differential of negative 65 or worse. They, they, they were abysmal, right? They were People forget this team was 6-7 and seven to start the season. Then in week 15, they beat the Cleveland Browns with Nick Mullins under center. They beat him on a last-second field goal. It wasn't even an easy win. Then they beat Drew Locke. And then they they, they had the Colts with, uh, with the COVID concerns that week. And then in week 18, they beat the Chargers in that really weird game where it felt like neither team really wanted to win. So I think they were extremely lucky to make the postseason last year. Their offensive line is horrific. I like Derek Carr probably more than you do, um, but he's not a guy that's going to win them a Super Bowl. I, I'm not a big – you need to have a good offensive line. You need to be able to win the line of scrimmage. They don't do that offensively or defensively. Tons of holes in the secondary, so not a big believer in them. The Cincinnati Bengals I feel very similarly about. I think they had some great matchups. And, again, football is a matchup sport. It's not, it's not always about having the most talent, but it's about having talent that matches up with your opponent. And I thought the teams that they played last year – going down the stretch and into the postseason, they matched up really well with those teams. That's harder to do over the course of 17 games. So I'm a little bit less high on the Bengals than I think a lot of people are. I was on there under for their season win total as well. History has shown us you can spend all the money you want on the offensive line. Typically it doesn't work out. If you want to improve the offensive line, you better draft big boys and, and develop them. So I think the Bengals struggles are here to stay. Joey Burrow also wasn't that great last year. Crucify me if you want. The dude, I think, had 14 or 15 interceptions, made a ton of turnover-worthy throws throughout the year. We saw that carelessness a lot in week one, and it showed up in the stat in the stat line because he had four picks. He didn't have four picks yesterday against Dallas, but the dude, if you watch the game, threw in the tight coverage over and over and over again. I think that's a sneaky pick. If you're looking at a guy to have the most interceptions in the NFL this year, it's Joey Burrow because the dude is going to start all 17 games if he's healthy. They are going to throw the ball a lot, and he's going to make bad decisions with the football. So that's my thought on those two. Um, Raiders are bad. The Bengals are probably not making the postseason. And then remind me, remind me of the third team. Uh, it's Denver, and Denver. I'll, I'll, Denver. I'll let you, I'll, I'll let you mull it over. My my initial thoughts are, it's just a continuity chemistry thing. I, I'm not as worried about Denver and, and Russell Wilson, who's been doing this a long time. It's probably a shock for all these skill position players to be playing with a competent quarterback for the first time in their NFL careers. It's, you know, Hamler and, and Judy and Sutton have been with Drew Locke and whoever else has come in from time to time. Uh, I'm okay. With, I'm okay with that. They were three for 12 on third downs, you know, kick three field goals. They left some points on the board. Um, Houston's also playing a little bit better than, you know, we expected expectations. So kudos for them for going out and battling as well. Uh, looks like Jerry Judy's day to day, so that's good news. And if he were to miss time, I'd be a little more concerned. But I have faith in Denver uh, figuring this thing out. I know it's not a very analytical response here, Kamish, but uh, what say you about the Broncos? The Broncos in Week One dominated the time of possession battle, thirty-four minutes to twenty-six against Seattle. They dominated the time of possession battle again against Houston. It, they're just making they, – they've been sloppy in week one, in these first couple of weeks. Week one, they had 12 penalties for over 100 yards. They fumbled twice on the goal line. They inexplicably kicked a 600-yard field goal for the win instead of just going forward on fourth down. And, you know, if they win that game 1917 or if they don't fumble twice at the goal line, I think we're having a lot less conversations about how, how bad the Broncos are because they'd be 2-0. and I think the Broncos are fine. They didn't play together at all in the preseason. None of the offensive line, the skill players, Russell Wilson didn't target – any of his receivers until near the end of the first half in week one. I think that was largely a function of the fact that those guys just hadn't played a game together. They would definitely rather be 
two and zero than one and one at this point. But I don't. I think it's far from time to hit the panic button with them. They're doing the fundamental things well. They're winning the time possession. They're they're keeping their defense off of the field. And if they can keep that defense fresh, they have all the talent in the world. I think they're going to make life very very difficult on opposing offenses. So for me, I'm still high on the Broncos. I don't think they're. I don't think anybody's better than KC in that division, but they're still a very good team. And I would be surprised if they don't win at least 10 games this fall. They followed up their 12 penalty week one outing with 13 more on Sunday. Uh, they averaged almost five and a half yards per play. So you're right. They're shooting themselves in the foot. And I think, you know, the cream always rises toward the top and they're doing most, they're doing like 85% of things, right? A little more discipline, a little more time on the field. I think they'll be okay. Um, Chief, you got anything else on Denver? Any closing thoughts? Or should we hit one more elephant in the room that uh, I kind of want to bring up? No, I'm good on Denver, man. Um, I really just wanted to get you guys' honest thoughts. Um, I didn't even watch the game yesterday. And so, look, may, call me old school. Maybe it is. But the teams that I am that I want to talk about, I do like to watch the games, even if I watch, like, the abbreviated version of just the plays, just because I, I want to see what's actually happening. Um, and so I didn't get a chance to see them play, so I really want to get your you guys' thoughts. So I appreciate it for sure. Definitely. All right, last one, and then we'll go to our look-ahead segment. Uh, Nick, you and I kind of wanted to talk about the same game here, and you told me pre-show that Tampa Bay defense is elite, super good. Um, and you know what? I was at the Tropicana in AC, and I got Tampa Bay money line at minus 105 after they fell behind in the first quarter, so I said, please take my money. Uh, and that worked out for me in the end. So what do you see from this Tampa Bay defense to, um, you know, I was watched quite a bit of yesterday. What are your thoughts on the Buccaneers and their defense? The biggest difference between Tampa Bay defensively this year and last year is that they're no longer vulnerable to the deep ball. And if you watch them a lot last year, and I'm, I'm the biggest TB12 guy in the world, so you best believe Tampa Bay is on my TV from the minute their their kickoff happens until that game is over. So I, I will criticize and, and evaluate everything on the screen in front of me. Last year, they gave up way too many big plays. A, a big reason for that was they were not healthy. They were a little bit over aggressive at times, trying to get to the quarterback, trying to get into the backfield because they were trying to cover up some of those, I, I think, uh, defensive injuries that they had. This year, they're healthy, and you can see the, the crazy amount of sheer raw talent that they have on the roster. And what's happening is, Todd Bowles is able to play a lot more conservatively without, without sacrificing any of what he's trying to get done defensively. What I mean by that, if you watched week one, he was in two high looks, almost 60% of the snaps. So he's not, he's not getting the linebackers. He's not getting extra DB support in the run game. He's just trusting a healthy defensive line to stop the run game uh, themselves. He's trusting the defense to do what they're like what, to, to handle their responsibilities on an individual basis, whether they're in zone or whether they're in man coverage, they have some of the most talented players in the entire league on the defensive side of the ball. They're not deep. I think they're one or two injuries away from going right back to what we saw last year, where they're going to be very vulnerable against the deep ball. They gave up more explosive plays last year than, than the Jacksonville Jaguars just for context. But this year they, I, I know they haven't played the cream, the cream of the crop yet with, I don't think Dallas's offense is very good. The Saints, I think, are like about a middle of the pack offense as well. But I think just seeing the difference in what Todd Bowles is doing from a strategic standpoint of frequent too high looks, not being over aggressive, going after the run game or trying to get into the opposing backfield to, to sack the opposing quarterback. I think this is a very, very sustainable way to keep points off the board. It frustrates teams. If you can't push the ball down the field, if you can't take shots when that's what you want to do to, to try to alter a game script, the Bucs might give up a decent amount of stuff underneath, but like people always talk about this bend, don't break defense. The Bucs aren't going to bend because of the talent. And even if someone does happen to get into Tampa Bay territory, they're definitely not going to break with all that talent that's on the defensive side of the ball. And again, we talked about a few minutes ago about you could have all the talent in the world. If you don't have the right guy calling the, sh calling the shots, you're going to look, you're going to get exposed. Todd Bowles is a, is a genius. I love what that guy does week to week. There was a big win that they had against new Orleans. Tom Brady struggled again under pressure didn't even matter. We're not talking at all about Tom Brady this week and what, what could have should have been because they got to win. And it, it, it's Todd Bowles. It's the defense. Antoine Winfield looks like one of the best uh, defensive players in the league. I'm really high on them personally. Well, well, let me ask you this. I'm sorry, man. Not, see, now I got to hop in. Not, now we're getting in the weeds. This is my kind of talk here. We get, we're getting in the weeds. And clearly we all knew Todd Bowles is like a defensive 
just aficionado, if you will, in the NFL. Like we knew this when he was in the with the Jets, but the Jets are just a bad organization. Like let's let's just be real about it. They're terrible. So now he's down in Tampa Bay. He's got, I mean, a superb collection of defensive talent, in my opinion. Um, you know, if you caught the interview yesterday, he's talking about what Todd Bowles is saying in the locker room, like, hey, just keep playing. Uh, we'll get some takeaways. James is going to give us the ball. Just just keep playing. Like, keeping, keeping this team in an extremely disciplined defensive fashion. Like, they're not going to make a lot of mistakes on defense. And when they're not going to make a lot of mistakes, with Tom Brady on the other side, and and I'm saying this because you expect the offense to catch up by the end of the season. And by catch up, I'm not saying they're going to score, you know, 28 points a game. I mean, with this defense, the way Todd Bowles is going to have his fingerprints over it as he as he's done in the past, they probably only need to score 21 points. That's it. If they score 21 points in most games, they're probably going to win. And look, once again, I picked the Saints to win the division because of their defense. And I felt like Jameis being able to maybe have have, have a, a slightly longer leash. Well, the slightly longer leash is still leading the interceptions. Jeez, God, Jameis. Just, I think we want Jameis to be a thing. Personally, I wanted Jameis to be a thing. It's just, it's just not happening. And once again, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers look like they're going to be the cream of the crop. Cream of the crop out of the NFC South, and this defense is going to be on fire if, if they stay healthy because Panthers aren't going to beat them. I can say that right now. And neither are the Atlanta Falcons. And the Saints didn't beat them at home. So it, it, you get what I'm saying? It's like I know it's week two, but you, you got to think about the opponents in the division unless we see drastic improvement from all three teams. You almost hand it to them. They're pretty much guaranteed to buy at this point. And now it's just down to who do they play out of probably, you know, the the NFC West, probably. Like, you know what I mean? Okay. The bottom line is that the defense, man, it's, it's going to be – they're going to be tough to beat, period. I, I will say this. I mean, New Orleans' run D showed up, too. Um, yeah, it was 3-3, three, three, like, third quarter. So, I get it. Yeah, like, they, it both close. teams played fine until the turnovers. But you you guys nailed it. Nick, I was watching that game, and I was thinking the whole time – they're perfectly fine with giving them six to eight yard out routes and hooks and whatever. Eventually, Jameis is going to give them the football. That's exact. The game plan. It was the perfect storm. You had the exact quarterback who eventually had a negative tendency that would kill them, and that's what happened. Eventually, Jameis would force the ball downfield when he shouldn't have. His hand got caught in the cookie jar, and he's just not one of those guys who's okay with methodically moving the ball downfield. It's just not in his damn DNA. It's not Jameis Winston. Uh, but you're right, uh, Tampa Bay's defense and the, the schematics on Sunday were fantastic. Everything went hand-in-hand, hand, and eventually Tom Brady is going to make one throw to beat you if you're going to give him enough opportunities. What a shocker. Julio Jones missed the second game of the year. Welcome to my life. Ooh, we're getting Julio Jones. Big signing. And it's good, unfortunately. I mean, I love the guy. He's one of the greatest route runners we've ever seen. Um, and by the way, the Oilers, a.k.a. the Titans, have a big game tonight against Buffalo and uh, – I'll probably be cracking open the whiskey bottle for that one. But, um, you know, uh, Brady made a throw. And I, I kind of it kind of felt like the last team Tom had before New England because all the skill players, you know, Godwin's off the field, Julio's hurt, Mike Evans got ejected after the brawl, and, Tom, and Gronkowski's obviously not there. Tom's probably thinking, shit, here we go again. I've Eventually, like, it doesn't matter how good you are, right? Like, Chief, we talk about this all the time. You need one playmaker out there. And it was Russell Gage. That was like his go-to. So it was really tough sledding. I mean, Kamish, I know, you know, you watched Tampa Bay quite a bit. Uh, and that was a grind. That was a struggle. But, you know, the better team won. And uh, the team that was better coached on that day definitely came away with the win. Yeah, and you mentioned, like, the, the six and eight yard out routes and things like that. New Orleans had one play that went for more than, 20, 20, more than 22 yards on offense on Sunday. And you mentioned Jameis getting impatient. Tampa Bay scored that touchdown to go up 10-3. Winston threw an interception on the next drive. Tampa Bay put points up again, went up 13-3. to Winston threw another interception on the next drive. So to get back to Chief's point of teams are going to get impatient against the Bucs. If you can manage to stick around and it'd be a 3-3 to game or a 7-7 to game into the second half, fine. 
But if Tom Brady makes that one throw, if you let Tampa get just a, a few points on the board, if you have a guy like Winston or and it doesn't even have to be an impatient quarterback, it'd be imp, an impatient offensive coordinator. that's like, man, we got to get these points back right away. Tampa Bay had 260 yards of total offense yesterday. They played like crap again, second week in a row on the offensive side of the ball. The offensive line is terrible. They won that game handily. That should be and scary. I did take Tom Brady under 270 and a half passing yards. That was like the easiest prop play I had all week. I said, oh, man, too easy. I knew Tom was going to be under duress for parts of the game, under 270 and a half. You knew he was going to have some guys out. And I, I figured it would be a decent defensive struggle. I also took Jameis over 227 and a half. Like, look, guys, here's the bottom line. As, as much as Jameis throws interceptions, because he's going to push the ball down the field, they're gonna, if they keep giving them to us at anywhere at 225, 220, like I'm just taking overs. And I hope he gets 300 yards at least three times this season because I took his season over two and a half, 300-yard games. Uh, that's a story for another day. I know we got to get out of here. Commission, man, this, this is always uh, – Super fun when we have you on, just just talking shop, man. Once again, just appreciate you coming on, hanging out with us for sure. Yeah, man, we got time for a quick uh, look ahead here, and then we'll wrap it up with story time and a quick quick food for thought at the end. But looking at this slate of week three games, I, I can tell you, I'm pegging this Detroit Minnesota game as our shootout uh, of next week. I think there's going to be a lot of points there, and I I would definitely warrant playing guys on both sides of the ball in this one. I mean. I'm sure St. Brown is going to be very popular, but how many people are going to pay 9300 for Justin Jefferson? I'm not quite sure yet. Um, that's something to consider. But St. Brown has been a monster. I don't think either defense is very good. I'm sure St. Brown at 7200 will be very popular in cash games as well. But, uh, you know, pending Monday night football here and everyone comes out healthy, I think this is a very interesting Dalvin Cook spot. I almost kind of hope Dalvin Cook doesn't have a great game against the Eagles so we can get decent ownership on him on Sunday. So, um, my first look ahead is, wow, that should be a fantastic game environment, Detroit and Minnesota. Chief, any thoughts on that one? And then give us another game you're looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it should. I mean, the, the Lions have been scoring points, man. And, you know, if you watch interviews from the Fox guys and they were talking about, you know, Coach Campbell and just saying, you know, they're going through a culture change and he's trying to get these young guys to buy in and, you know, Dan Campbell was a no-nonsense guy. and it's Just work hard, put your nose in the ground, keep grinding. And I think that's what the Lions are doing. You know, they talked about Jared Goff and not that he's some elite quarterback, but, you know, he's going to keep them stable at the position and all sorts of things. Definitely, if the Lions can keep scoring points, I think they're good. I do want to take – I do want to see what the Vikings do tonight. Uh, well, see what they do on Monday Night Football. Uh my game of the week is actually, or my look ahead here, is actually one that I think is, is going to feel like Puke City until you really take a step back and think about it. And it's actually the Falcons-Seahawks game. And, and let me tell you why. We, we saw the Falcons. They were able to score some points yesterday and move the ball a little bit uh, against the Rams. Uh, week one, they were able to score the ball. This is also a team that kicks a lot more field goals than most than most teams. So they, they continue to hang around, right? A.K.A. Jim Harbaugh, kick more field goals. Um, but they, they hang around. And I think this is a game where you've got two uh, fringe teams, if you will. They're not going to make the playoffs, but they're not going to be at the bottom. And now they get to face each other. And I think we saw Geno Smith and, and this team move the ball a little bit against Denver. We saw them not move the ball very much against San Francisco, as they should not have because San Francisco's defense is pretty good. And now they get a matchup with the Atlanta Falcons, who will be able to move the ball in their defense, but they're going to be able to move the ball against them as well. This, this screams sneaky, fringe, bad team shootout to me. I really like this game, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the total is probably going in somewhere around 44 and a half, 45 and a half. That would be my early guess. I could be wrong, maybe somewhere in the 40s. It's not going to come in at 52 and a half. I can tell you that now. I'm thinking let's go 44 and a half on that game, and I think that's going to be a little bit too low. I think both of these teams are going to be able to move the ball. Uh, we saw, once again, we've got to play Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, Russian roulette. 
Tyler Lockett has what 12 targets in that game. DK has what six, seven, and, and we're back at it. And it's not Russell Wilson's fault. It's the same thing with Geno. So I'm just gonna say, hey, it's probably a DK Metcalf week. And uh let, let's see what he does against the Falcons. I'm very intrigued by this matchup. I won't be playing Geno Smith, but I do like Mariota here, and I do like these receivers, and I, I think on both sides of the ball, we should see. We should see them be able to move it pretty good here. Like this, this feels like a juicy bad team matchup to me. Yeah, God forbid Arthur Smith used Kyle Pitts in any way that he should. Uh, Kamish, any game environment catching your attention? Any spreads or totals that you're kind of salivating over early in the week? I think the Atlanta Falcons could win by a touchdown next week. I like it. I'm serious. Yes. I mean, we, we've now that now that we've seen two weeks of Denver football, we see that they have some chemistry issues, and and why not? Why not? Tell tell me, Kamish. Tell me more. I think because he's not using Kyle Pitts, right? He he doesn't care about your fantasy football team. He's he's trying to win games, and again, like I've, I I've really gotten into film this year more than I have in past years. And if anybody like if you're looking for film, all twenty two, it's like five bucks a month, uh, NFL Plus. It's great to be able to go back and look at specific plays if you saw something while you're watching the game and you want to bookmark it on your phone or leave yourself a note and go back and figure out what exactly happened on a play. Arthur Smith is scheming people open. I mean, my God, he, he looks like an offensive genius. I mean, you give Arthur Smith some, some talent, some real talent on that football team. Atlanta's got their next Super Bowl contending coach. In my opinion, Marcus Mariota is not the guy that's going to take them to the postseason. There's nothing really to like on the entire roster. I mean, I wrote about them in the preseason. There's nothing like on the offensive line. The defensive line is awful. The secondary, you could talk yourself into liking, but only because it's better than the rest of the awfulness on the roster, not because it's actually good in its own right. Arthur Smith is a really good football coach, though. I've been impressed with what I've seen the first two weeks against them. I thought they sort of had shell shock at the end of that Tampa game, and they went into that quasi-prevent defense, and then Tampa came back and won. I think if Atlanta, I think if that game was week three, I think Atlanta has a little bit more fortitude, in there, and they're able to hold on and win that game. They, we saw they almost came back and beat the the Rams in week two. They're not a team that's going to roll over and play dead if they go down early. They've had the road test already. This is a t- like I'm not going to sit here and say the Falcons are going to make the playoffs, but I think they're this year's Detroit Lions. Of they're going to beat bad teams and they're going to cover the spread against really really good teams because of how hard they play and because of how well coached they are. I also think the Green Bay Packers are so overvalued going into to Raymond James this week to play Tom Brady and the Bucks and. Remember, I'm a huge Tom Brady fan, so don't go bet your mortgage on Tom Brady this week. I think there's plenty of concerns with with Tampa Bay's offensive line, and, and if we don't get if if Evans ends up being suspended, and the the appeal doesn't doesn't work, I think that's obviously a huge loss, especially if Godwin's not back, if Julio's not back. But the Green Bay Packers are not a a good football team. They they're they're not, at least not by Green Bay standards. They were run off the field in Week One by the Minnesota Vikings because. The Vikings were a far superior football team. It wasn't any of this like, oh, it's week one. The Packers always do this week one. The Vikings are better than the Green Bay Packers. The Packers oh, yeah. are way better than a really bad Chicago Bears team. And we saw that last night. The hallmark of Green Bay's offensive strategy in recent seasons has been they've kept their really mediocre, overrated defense on the sidelines for the majority of games. They would win the time of possession battle every single week. So when the defense was on the field, they'd be fresh. They did that against the Chicago Bears, predictably. They had the football for almost 40 minutes in that game. They ran 20-something more plays than the Bears did on Sunday. If you think the Green Bay Packers are going to run 20 more plays than the Tampa Bay Bucks in week three, you're crazy. Oh, no, they're not. The Green Bay's they're dead not. this week. I mean, not this week. Whenever they play the Bucks, they're done. You don't have to twist this week. This to, week. To, to, this to bash week. the Packers on this show. But uh, look, though. God, I'm, I'm not going to turn this into an Aaron Rodgers rant. I promise. But, but well, we've got two minutes, so we've got plenty of time. Uh, we got to get the GPP food of the day in, though. <laughs> Seriously, though, I had a guy almost want to get into a Twitter beef with me about Aaron Rodgers. But look, man, <laughs> I, I, I'm not changing my stance on Aaron Rodgers until he gets – until he's the reason this team can win football games. I'm not buying into the fact that he's as elite. The media, I'm telling you, the media has made Aaron Rodgers giving him a giving him a pedestal that he doesn't deserve. That's all I'm saying. He's not a elite quarterback that 
can just do it all. Like that that's that's not who he is. He, he's not that guy. And if and he we, was, they, they would have already won three or four Super Bowls after winning NFC championships and, and winning the NFC North every year. But they never win. They never go all the way. They get to – sometimes they don't get out of round one after a bye week, after a bye week. And you're telling me that Aaron Rodgers is the GOAT? Like, get out of here. I can't accept that. I, I can't. I um, I almost want to take – it. that total is 44 and a half on win bet, and it's 41 everywhere else. I kind of want to go maybe take that 44 and a half under. It just feels like a grind of a game. Skill players missing. Tampa Bay is going to bend but don't break. It's going to be slow, I think, right? Both teams want to run the ball. I, I don't know. What do you think about the under at 44 and a half, Kamesh? I would jump on the under 44 and a half for one reason and one reason only. If Aaron Rodgers gets frustrated at any point in this game, like we saw in week one against the Vikings, he's the type of kid on the playground that takes his ball and goes home if things aren't the way that they're he going. He was frustrated that, that he last go. night. Like, yeah, it's, he, he was frustrated yesterday. Like, yeah. seriously, like, just watch the game. You'll see what I'm saying with Aaron Rodgers. I have to speak up for, for the – Listen, we're a small media market here in fantasy sports. Stephen A. Smith and all these guys on ESPN have given Aaron Rodgers this, you know, he go and, and, and be the king of London for all we care after, after the queen has passed away. Uh, my condolences to to, to the, the monarchy. Uh, he might as well go and be that because that's what they've, they've given him a crown as the best quarterback in the league. <laughs> and guess what? It's false. I'll tell Stephen A. to his face. I'll tell the whole NFL. I'll tell Aaron Rodgers to his face. It's false. Those are lies. He's not the best quarterback in the league. He's probably top 12 with the emphasis on 12. Like he may be outside of the top 10 by the time this season is over. But because he wins the MVP and they win an FC North every year, everybody gives him this. Anyway, I'm done. But Nick, Nick understands what I'm saying, though. I know you do, Nick. That's why we got him on the show. He gets it. We, we got to. We got to go on to a quick story time and GBP food of the day before you give me time to talk about the Indianapolis Colts without shut out by the Jacksonville Jaguars are 0 2 and also given uh you know this pedi- put on this pedestal by the media much like Aaron Rodgers is but we're not going to get into that this week because you don't have time but they did get shut out by the Jacksonville Jaguars I just want to just want to throw that back out there that they got shut out by the Jacksonville Jaguars and they're 0 1 and 1 with Matt Ryan and everybody gave them the division and I'm going to stop right there because I just started going a little bit and I would have kept going if if you threw a lighter on the fire it just would have went would have been would have been out there um all right do you have any GPP food of the day or story time, Chief? I know we have a jam-packed schedule. That's why this pod's a little bit shorter than we typically run way over. I'm holding my story time until next week. Next week's story time will commence for the Chief. It is really exciting, though. I, I know what it is. Like, on a scale yes. of 1 to 10, this is like a 13. You're going to want to come back and listen again next week for sure. So yeah. we'll leave it at that. Um Nick, can I put you on the spot? I know you know you came on this pod once. You gave us some good food suggestions. So do you have do you have any stories or any food suggestions for GPP food of the day? Food suggestions. I just if you're again, I'm in Cleveland. If you if you want to celebrate a a really nice occasion, I just took my my, my mom just turned sixty uh, a couple of weeks ago. I took her, a bunch of her friends, a bunch of our family friends to Pomeroy House. It's in Strongsville. Really elegant place. Fantastic service. The wine is outstanding. I've never, you can order anything on that menu and it's going to be delicious. You can get the filet mignon, you can get the shrimp, their the risotto. I, I would literally just eat a whole bowl of their risotto and pay $45 for it and have a little bit of wine and go home. It's fantastic. It's very easy to get in and out of. They have valet if you're one of those people that doesn't want to park their own car. It's, it's a really nice place, special occasion or not. They also have an, an outdoor patio that's a little bit more casual. So you can just stop by there as well for, for some lunch or for a little bit less fine dining. But highly, highly recommend that place if you happen to be in the area. I love it. Good stuff. Uh, my, my quick GPP food of the day is Casa Taco at uh, the Tropicana Atlantic City. My little tour of Atlantic City this summer. Casa Taco. That's the place to go if you want authentic Mexican food uh, in Atlantic City. You know, go upstairs and bet sports in the William Hill sports book and then go downstairs and enjoy some tacos and tequila. You can't beat it. And uh, if you tuned in a couple weeks ago, we were talking about dating etiquette and we talked about going to eat wings and, 
and bar food and, and et cetera. And let me tell you, I was out with, let's, let's call her a girl named Tiffany, which isn't her name, but we'll protect everyone's identity on the show, who put up with me after I did have some Reposado tequila, by the way. So uh, she got the gold star, but it was pretty much kind of like what we talked about. I mean, I had these like three beef tacos and it was just like a, a slop fest on the table. And it was just kind of like we were on the same page. Hey, we're going to eat this delicious food. I'm going to have some tequila. Uh, we're going to let it go. And we hung out for the day. So, I mean, you know, it sounds like a keeper. I mean, I'm interested. That there's some definitely some. If you could put up with me after I drink some tequila. And, and unfortunately, like, what are the odds? I'm sitting here at this restaurant. And the rerun of the Titans-Giants game is on every TV surrounding me. As you know, I'm a big Titans fan. Like, it's college football Saturday. It was like. I was trying to not see my own personal hell and focus on the table in front of me as the Titans collapsed against the Giants last week. So uh, Casa Taco, you know, good place for a date or a good place to go out to get it, some tequila and some good Mexican food in Atlantic City. And uh, that's about it. So thanks for putting up with me, Tiffany, which isn't your name. But anyway, Chief, I'm so excited to hear your story time next week. Um, it, it's going to be uh, more epic than – food or dating or anything <laughs> and he's laughing over there so uh nick thank you so much appreciate you coming on always man i i'll be on here anytime you guys want to invite me to talk football i feel like i get smarter talking to you guys it's always good to vent about aaron Rodgers. if you ever start a second podcast it's just bashing on aaron Rodgers. sign me up for that i'll be a co-host you don't even have to pay me i'll be on it let me know always good talking with you guys Nick, bro, listen, man, just so glad you came on, man. This is, it's always a good time. Always. Yeah. No, we get smarter talking to you and so do our listeners. Let's be real here. So we appreciate you bringing that angle uh, to the show and we'll see what week three brings us. So we're going to get out of here. Crazy schedule this week. We have so much content going on between Roto Grinders and Scores and Odds, of course. So a little bit quick, quick wrap up to the show here, but we'll be back next week, same time, same place. And uh, there'll be a lot more to unwrap, definitely. So for the Chief, Will Priester, and the Commish, I'm the Looch. Good luck and have a good week, everybody. <laughs>